Uh, If you would this morning, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 is where we'll be this morning as we study together. In our Wednesday night class, we have been studying through the book of Matthew. And as we near the end of the book, we are coming to the end of the earthly ministry of Jesus. In fact, we are now in that last week of his life on earth before his death on the cross. And as that week begins in Matthew chapter 21, not where we are this morning, but in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus enters into the city of Jerusalem. And he begins to spend time in that city leading up to his death. He even spends time at the temple and in the area that surrounds the temple. And in these very last days of his earthly ministry that has gone on for more than three years now, Jesus is preaching and he's teaching about the kingdom of God. He is preaching and he is teaching about heaven and he's preaching and teaching about the church. And as he teaches, we read that he uses several parables here even in these last days. And parables, as we know, are these earthly stories that have a heavenly or a spiritual meaning. And the parables that Jesus uses now uh, preach and teach about obeying God and teach about rejecting God. And that is exactly what is about to happen. He's teaching about things that needed to be heard, that needed to be spoken, that needed to be taught in these final days. We read of the parable of the two sons in chapter 21. There is one son that rejects his father but later obeys him. And then there is the second son who agrees and obeys or agrees to obey his father but ultimately uh, never does. And uh, Jesus is teaching about God the Father, of course, and that there are some who will say they are obedient to God but they aren't. And there are some who might first reject God, but ultimately they'll come to obey him. And as Jesus ends that parable, he asks the question, which one has obeyed his father? Which has done his father's will? He teaches with the parable of the landowner at the end of chapter 21. And the landowner uh, owns this vineyard and he rents it or employs these vine growers to care for it. At some point, at the appropriate time, he sends slaves or servants to collect the produce or the profits of that vineyard. And and they arrive and they are rejected. The vine growers kill those slaves and servants. And so the owner of the vineyard, the landowner, again, he sends another group, a greater group, a larger group of slaves or servants. They kill them as well. And so that landowner then determines, I'm going to send my own son. They will respect my son. Surely they won't reject him. They won't kill him. But of course, they do. And again, we know that landowner is God. It's the Father in heaven. And those vine growers who were charged with caring for that vineyard, those are the Israelites, the Jewish people, maybe the Jewish leaders of the day or throughout history. Those groups of slaves that have been sent to collect the produce or the profits of that vineyard represent the profits that God had sent uh, over centuries and generations over and over again and who were killed by the Israelites over and over again. And of course, it's so easy to see that the Son is God's Son. God's Son, Jesus, who would be rejected just like all of the others and who would be killed. In chapter 22, uh, there is the parable of the marriage feast. And in the parable of the marriage feast, a king gives a feast for his son's marriage. And many, many are invited, but no one Absolutely no one was willing to come to that feast. Many are invited a second time, and the call goes out. Everything is ready, but they ignore that invitation. The Bible says they went on their way. They had other things to do. They had uh, their own things to do. They had no interest in attending that celebration. Some of those people took the slaves who had brought out that invitation, and the Bible says in the parable that they abused them and even killed them. The king, who is the father of the groom, tells his slaves, Now go out and invite even more people. Go out to the highways and and basically invite anyone you can find. This invitation is now open to everyone, and that feast is filled with people from all sorts of different backgrounds. And again, the king, the father, is God, our father in heaven. And those invited guests are the Jewish people, and they had heard about the Messiah long before anyone else. They had been invited to obey God long before anyone else. But ultimately, they would again reject God's invitation. These are 
the last teachings of Jesus before his death on the cross. These are the things that are exactly what needs to be said in his final days. As he stood and as he taught in Jerusalem, as he spoke to crowds of people made up of Pharisees and Sadducees who are the religious elite and the religious leaders of the day, Crowds made up of his own disciples, men who had followed him really since they were called very early on, the very beginning of his ministry, and made up of crowds of people uh, who were Jews who had gathered in that city for the purpose of celebrating, commemorating, remembering the Passover. He's speaking to people who have been waiting their entire lives for the Messiah to finally come and speaking to people who are about to reject the very Son of God. And after he teaches with a few parables, he answers a few questions, he asks a few questions, and then his teaching becomes far more pointed and far more direct than it it has ever been before. In chapter 23, the Bible tells us now that he is teaching crowds of people, and they are people who've come to Jerusalem, who've come to the temple again for the Passover. And history tells us that uh, there were likely two million people in the city of Jerusalem uh, during this week. His death is only a few days away. And the words that Jesus shares with that crowd, shares with the disciples, again, are exactly what they needed to hear in these final moments. I don't know if you've ever thought about what your last words would be. Um, Sometimes we hear about someone's last words and they are profound, as if they have thought about that their entire lives, or in that moment they knew exactly what to say. Sometimes we hear about them and they're not profound at all. It's something completely arbitrary or or out of character. I imagine the very Son of God, who was God himself, God in the flesh, when he chose these last things to say, he chose exactly what needed to be said. And one of the things that Jesus teaches in these last days, is don't be a Pharisee. Don't be a Pharisee. Don't think like a Pharisee. Don't act like a Pharisee. Don't behave like Pharisees behave. Don't worship like Pharisees worship. Don't even look up to them as some kind of uh, spiritual leader or righteous man that you need to follow the example of. And it's not as if Jesus hasn't said some of this before. As his ministry even began, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, he told the crowds there and the Pharisees who were present, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes of Pharisees, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. But now in these very last days, in some of his very last teachings, with those who have been closest to him all along, In what I think is likely the very last time he presents to crowds of people who have gathered around to hear what this man Jesus has to say, Jesus says, don't be a Pharisee. And of course he gives a few reasons that I want us to consider this morning. Number one, he tells them, don't be a Pharisee because Pharisees are filled with pride. In chapter 23, beginning in verse 1, Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Don't be a Pharisee because the Pharisees are filled with pride. Jesus tells these crowds they have taken the place of Moses. They have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Moses was God's preacher to the people. He was God's leader and ruler of the people. Moses was chosen by God to fill that role. And the Bible tells us that he was more humble than any man that was on the face of the earth. But the scribes and the Pharisees, unlike Moses, have taken it upon themselves to lead and to teach, to preach to, and even to rule over God's people. They have given themselves authority. And unlike Moses, they aren't working for God. They aren't working to serve the people. The Pharisees are only serving themselves. And Jesus is saying, don't be like the Pharisees. Don't be a Pharisee. In verse 3, he makes it clear. He says, therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe. But do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. Everything that they tell you to do, and we know he's saying that is according to the law of Moses, 
That's their role. As long as they teach you according to the law of Moses, everything they tell you to do, do those things, observe those things, that's God's law. You need to obey God's law. But do not do according to their deeds. Don't do what they do. Don't act like they act. Don't behave as they behave. Again, don't be a Pharisee. And you can imagine how these words spoken to this crowd, this large crowd of people might drive the Pharisees who were present uh, almost out of their minds. In verse 13, we know that they're there because if we skip down a little farther, we see that Jesus turns his attention directly to them and he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. After he preaches to the crowd in general and to his disciples, he turns right at them and and he gets them in, in his sights and he tells them exactly what they are. They're men who have taken it upon themselves to stand before the people and to rule over the people, even to condemn God's people. And Jesus says that they are living lives filled with sin. In chapter 23 and verse 25, if we get a little deeper into this, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. And he's telling them, you have this, uh, this high opinion of cleanliness, and you put all this focus on cleanliness, even physical cleanliness, and that is part of what they do religiously and part of their worship He's telling them, you love to clean the outside. You love to look beautiful on the outside. But inside, you are absolutely filled with sin. And that is hypocrisy. And that's what the Pharisees were. And it didn't just happen by accident. Jesus said that they have knowingly and willingly and gladly put themselves in that position. They have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. In verse 5, if we back up, he says that they do all of their deeds to be noticed by men. Everything that they do, they do to be seen of men. That means that nothing they do is done out of sincerity. In verse 6, he says they love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by men. They love for you to say, wow, there's a Pharisee. Wow, look at how he's dressed. Look how righteous that man is. Wow, we need to put him in the front row or or call him by a special name when we see him in the marketplace. They love that sort of thing because they are absolutely filled with sinful pride. Later, Jesus says that they are whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but full of death and decay on the inside. As we come to the end of this little section in verse 11, We see Jesus make this statement that must have been confusing and also comforting uh, to that crowd of people. Maybe something that they had never heard when he says, But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. Whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Whoever exalts himself, maybe whoever seats himself in the chair of Moses shall be humbled. Don't be filled with pride, Jesus is saying. Don't be a Pharisee. Second, he says, don't be a Pharisee because Pharisees are unwilling to help others. It is bad enough that they have puffed themselves up with pride, but Jesus makes it clear that they are absolutely unwilling to help anyone else. If we back up to verse 4, he describes exactly what these men do. Jesus answered, oh, excuse me, let me back up. They, They tie up heavy burdens and they lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much or as much as a finger. He tells them, these men don't care about you. They don't care about how hard your life is. And they're certainly not trying to make your life any easier. In fact, all that they're doing or everything that they're doing is making your spiritual life more difficult than it needs to be. He says they tie up heavy burdens. And you can maybe picture in your mind a a big heavy sack of grain or something that needed to go to market. And it's as if these Pharisees are tying up these heavy sacks and laying them on the shoulders of others. They're giving people more to do than they need to give them to do. He's saying they're making your life extraordinarily more difficult. And yet they are completely unwilling to move them with as much as a finger. They are completely 
unwilling to help. And you know, it doesn't take that much effort to help someone else. Uh, some of this was mentioned this morning, but it, it really doesn't take that much to offer uh, an enormous amount of spiritual encouragement. And the same is true in our physical lives. I don't know how much time you all have spent in a gym, or you can imagine what it's like in a gym. Uh, many years ago, I spent a little bit of time in a gym. I know it doesn't show. Uh, but when you are working out in the gym and you're lifting weights, maybe you're at the bench press, you've got your back laying on that bench, and you are a bar across your chest lifting the heaviest amount of weight that you can possibly lift. And at some point, that weight becomes too heavy for your muscles that have tired and filled with that acid that, that burns so badly. And, and you don't know if you're going to get that bar up to the rack or not. And in those moments, it is wonderful to have a spotter. And you've seen that, someone who stands above that person who's lifting, and they have their hands ready just in case they can't make it to the top. All that spotter has to do is literally use one, maybe two fingers to add just a little pressure to that bar, and it feels almost as if it is weightless. It doesn't take that much effort to help someone else, and yet the Pharisees are unwilling to lift even a finger. The Pharisees make God's law an incredible burden for everyone else, Jesus says. They stand above you and they condemn you for, for failing to keep the law. But it's not the law of Moses that you have failed to keep. It is the law of men. It is the law of the Pharisees. Moses had ten commandments and those were expanded, I think, to 613 commandments uh, in the Old Testament. And the Pharisees have taken that and they have run out of town. Moses said, uh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. You weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath. The Pharisees said, you can't knead bread. You can't mix dough. You can't sew thread. You can't tie a knot. They added all kinds of extra laws to make that burden even heavier than it should be. They are men who are filled with pride. They are men who are unwilling to help others. But even worse than either one of those, Jesus says, don't be a Pharisee because Pharisees are standing in the way of the gospel. Jesus knew the hearts of men. And Jesus says that these men are standing in the way of the gospel. They stand between men and women and the spiritual salvation that comes only from God. And we have seen this several times throughout the ministry of Jesus. The Pharisees seem to always be there asking questions, trying to trick Jesus or trying to trap Jesus in some statement that's going to allow them to not only discredit him before the people, but to ultimately put him to death. The Pharisees know that Jesus has come from God. In John chapter 3, it's Nicodemus who is a Pharisee himself who comes to Jesus by night. Perhaps he doesn't want to seen by, be seen by anyone else speaking to Jesus. And he says, Rabbi, we know that you have come here from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. We know where you have come from. We know that you have come from God. We know that God has sent you here. The miracles that Jesus performed, the feeding of thousands of hungry people, the healing of maybe countless sick, uh, the, the causing of numerous blind to see and lame to walk, even raising the dead back to life. The Pharisees could do none of those things. They knew that Jesus was from God. They understood that he must be from God. There is no other explanation for it. And yet they are so jealous of the attention and the crowds and the love that Jesus receives that they have sought to put him to death. And they'll have their chance in just a few days. But until that day, and after that day, in fact, these men stand in the way of the gospel. Look at verse 13 of chapter 23. Jesus says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. For you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. The gospel is the good news of God's saving grace. Again, mentioned this morning. The gospel is the good news of God's plan of salvation. It is the good news that God has sent his son so that you and I can spend eternity in heaven with God himself. And the Pharisees are actively keeping people away 
from the gospel. They're keeping people away from the kingdom. They're keeping people away from God. They're keeping people away from that salvation. Jesus says, you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. You are standing in the way of the gospel. You're actively working to keep those people out of heaven. And you're doing it because you're unwilling to humble yourselves. You're not getting into the kingdom. And maybe it is that since you're not going to make it, nobody's going to make it. If I can't go, if I can't get along, if I can't be the leader in this thing, no one's going to be part of it. You are filled with pride. You have puffed yourself up, Pharisees. You love the praise of men. You're unwilling to help others. You only make their burden greater. And yet you don't lift a finger. You're now standing in the way of the gospel, keeping people out of the kingdom of God, keeping people out of heaven. And Jesus says to the crowds, to his disciples, even to the Pharisees that are standing there listening to this word, don't be a Pharisee. Don't be like the Pharisees. Don't think like the Pharisees. Don't act like the Pharisees. And I think if Jesus was here with us today, I think if we were there present with him then, he would say the very same thing to us. And I realize that you or I, there's no chance that we're ever going to describe ourselves as Pharisees or be called Pharisees. There's no office in the Lord's church. There's no organization that I'm aware of that uses that name today. But I imagine that all of us at some point, in some way, have struggled with pride. Have struggled with enjoying the praise of others a little too much or puffing our own selves up. I imagine at some point all of us have failed to be willing to help others or missed those opportunities or ignored those opportunities. And maybe none of us have stood in the way of the gospel, but maybe we have failed to lead others to the gospel. Jesus said, don't be a Pharisee. Again, don't act like them. Don't live like them. Don't behave like them. Don't think like a Pharisee thinks. Instead, maybe we should say, be a Christian. Be like Christ. Live like Christ. Think like Christ. Act like Christ would act. Instead of filling yourself with pride or being filled with pride, humble yourself. Allow God to lift you up. That's what Christ did. Instead of being unwilling to help others, consider the needs of others even more than you consider your own. Look for ways to encourage others, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ. Look for ways to help others spiritually. And I know, again, we don't stand in the way of the gospel in the same way that these men did at this very unique time in history. But perhaps it should be said, don't fail to lead others to the gospel. Share the good news of God's salvation with everyone that you can. I think it's important and noteworthy that in the very last days of the life of Christ, this is what he chose to preach and to teach. To the crowds of Jews gathered for Passover. To the disciples who had followed him for years but still needed to hear these words. To the Pharisees themselves and even to each one of us today. This morning, we offer the invitation to anyone who might need to respond. If you have never obeyed the gospel, we invite you to make that decision today. The Bible teaches that if you hear the word of God and you believe it, if you are willing to repent of sin in your life and confess the name of Jesus before men, confess that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that you believe that he is Lord, that you can go down into the waters of baptism and have your sins washed away. You come out of those waters to walk in a newness of life. You are added to the church. You become a child of God. You become a member of the body of Christ. If you haven't done that, we invite you to do that today. Maybe you have been baptized, but you have sin in your life. And maybe that sin is public in nature and demands a public repentance. Maybe it's, it's private and just needs to be repented of and, and, and prayed to God for forgiveness. If that is the case, we want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. We don't want you to leave here carrying that burden of sin and separation. Maybe you just need the prayers of this congregation. Maybe you need the help that the Pharisees were unwilling to give. Again, let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. Whatever your need might be this morning, please make it known. Let us know. Come forward while we stand, while we sing this invitation song.